John Ford. All right, Richard and Christine Asher. Excellent. Nola and Phil Baxter. Holly and Jerry Noy. I know they may be in the back working at Brian Kemp. All right, Brian, good deal. So I'm flipping through all these applications here. Uh, John Kerr, there he is. John is up and ready to go. Timothy Fortin, I think that was our entire class, I believe. We want to welcome them into church membership today. There's Phil, he's coming in, all right. Let's, let's just pray for them for a second. Lord, we ask you, we thank you, Lord, for our members. I mean, truly, it's not that we treat members in like a special way and, and non-members, Lord Jesus, as if something was wrong with them. Lord, we love all that are here, but members have said in a very unique way, we want to belong here. We want to have a say. We want to take a hand and, and make this the mission of this church go forward in reaching our community. We thank you for these members. We ask you to bless them. Lord, some of them have already been serving in gifts in amazing ways. Some of them are just coming into that now. We ask you that you'd open doors for them that no man can shut. And Lord Jesus, let them be excited and happy about working alongside us. And us, Lord, encourage them in all ways possible. We thank you and praise you. We ask of your spirit's blessing in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. God bless you folks. <laughs> praise the Lord. Always nice to welcome in members. That's a good thing. As you know, we do have our annual business meeting today, uh, not during service, of course, but as soon as service is over, we'll ask you to go out and grab a cup of coffee, go to the bathroom, do what you got to do, probably 15 minutes after service ends, we'll go ahead and begin. Uh, I will do my best to, to keep things, we always want people to be able to ask questions, but we also want to keep it cogent and short. How many of you love long business meetings? So you started to raise your hand and went, yeah, yeah, yeah maybe not. So, so we, we want to communicate what has to be communicated without driving you nuts. So we're, we're going to do that. Have some elections. I think it's going to be awesome. Today we want to talk about the idea, continue, as God's got this on my heart and he hasn't let go of it, the idea of wisdom. Learning the difference between the noise and assumptions of our own culture and the wisdom that God has given us for living life well. Now how many of you know that human beings seem to have a flair for technology? Give it enough people and enough tools, they'll come up with some new way to do something. How many of you remember when phones actually you had to dial them? How many of you have never seen a dial phone? You have no idea what I'm talking about. Okay, nobody's going to admit to that. Oh, okay, hey, it's just, how many of you are old enough to remember when we programmed computers with punch cards? Yeah, you know, it was kind of wild, you know, you had to, 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 you know, this is where hanging chads had new meanings, you know, and, and, and it's amazing how that worked. The, our race has done great with technology, however, when it comes to what God is doing, what God is saying, we find ourselves as human beings continually reaching for what looks good, but doesn't work nearly so well. This morning, I want to take a little time to talk about a word that does not get used much anymore. And when it is used, I think it's mostly used wrong. We fail to understand what it is. We fail to understand why it's supposed to have any place in our life at all. So what we want to do is we want to learn a little bit about the word holiness. Holiness. That's the word. Now I'm going to ask you a question. What is it? Set-apartedness. Okay, that, that's good, Nola. Set-apartedness. People being focused on and dedicated to the actions of what? Who? God. Set apart in this from this life to God. Excellent definition. Anyone want to flesh that out a little bit more? Nothing wrong with it. Great definition. Yes. Purity. Okay. I, I, you, I did this a long time ago I, to show an illustration. How many of you would like a good cold bottle of Coke? Or Pepsi or whatever it is you're into. You know, Somebody hands me Mountain Dew. Eh, I don't care if it is cold. You're like, ah. <laughs> All right. So eh, I know you love it, man. You make it work. I, I just can't do that. Um, so anyway, I, I brought a nice ice cold, you know those ice cold Cokes where the dew is just running down the outside of the bottle? I, I, I'm making it worse now, aren't I? And it was just, just that way, and I brought it into to, to service, and I'm talking. I was using an illustration about purity, John. And I took that bottle. It was a hot summer day, too, when I did it. You know, I mean, it wasn't hot in here. The air was on. If I popped the bottle of Coke, Coke open, and I went, <laughs> anybody want this? 
Nobody wanted it. I just ruined the bottle of Coke, right? Now, we said that Coke was 99.99% from the factory. But that 0.01% was the thing that grossed everybody out, and nobody wanted my Coke. Purity, right? You, 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 want, you want it pure. You want it right. You want it sterile. You don't want somebody else's spittle in it. I mean, it, it's, it's a good thing. Holiness is purity. Holiness is set-apartedness. What else? Righteous. What is, that's, that's a good word. What does it mean? Doing things the right way for the right we reason? Okay. Yeah, excellent, excellent. These are all good answers. And I wasn't looking for more because you failed to give enough. I just, you know, it's a complicated concept. Holiness. Once upon a time, it was part of a spiritual conversation. Now, the word holiness just doesn't get used very much. And most of what we hear in the world about the whole idea of holiness is pretty negative. Okay, now I gotta ask you a question about reviews. How many of you are, are you get online and you click and click and you go to shop or look for restaurants or movies and you try to check out reviews? Why? Are you not capable of making up your own mind? Okay, balanced viewpoint. <clears throat> now, how many of you do that? You, you wanna get a address, ladies, click the click the click. Or guys, you're into a tool, click the, and you find there's always negative reviews. My dress self-destructed. My tool broke the first time I used it. How many of you have not purchased because of negative reviews? Now, how many of us are just kind of cross-grained? We're just, we, we're contrary. And somebody throws a negative review at you, you're going to buy it on purpose just to prove them otherwise. How many contrarians? Okay, we've got, right? I mean, sometimes it's like, yeah, it can't be that bad. Yes, I want one. Click, put it in the basket. You know, I mean, yeah. I, I, I can't tell you, though, how many times I have steered away from, I don't watch a lot of movies, but I've steered away from movies because somebody goes, ah, that's not very good. And then, like, years later, I get a chance to watch it, and I'm like, eh, and I watch it. Oh, that was a great movie. It can happen, right? How many of you know that not all reviews are honest? Have you ever left a review on a day that you are ticked off? Come on. Some of you are nodding. Some of you are going, what, me? But, but some of you are nodding, right? It's the lousiest tool I have ever had. Why? Because it <laughs> fell off the table. And I'm mad. You know, okay, it can happen, right? I, I spilled my coffee on it, a dress. I, I hate this dress. I, whatever. There can be that. How many of you know that sometimes there are actually people who write reviews that are paid by the competition? We find that all the time. You know, I mean, Amazon's got this, but he's got this over there, and the person over there is going, Amazon's product stinks. There are fraudulent reviews. There are dishonest reviews, but sometimes those reviews have a way of changing our attitude, and we miss out on things because we're, we're believing something wrong. Now, when it comes to the idea of holiness, I think that our culture really looks at holiness in a bad way. Most people in the world simply don't understand holiness. I think we get the idea that everybody that's not saved hates holiness and wants to destroy it. Honestly, I don't think that that's the case. I don't think they think about it at all. It is unimportant to them. In fact, I'd say most people just, they, they've bought the reviews of culture that they believe holiness is something that hurts their happiness. If you're going to talk about holiness at all, if you're going to read anything from Scripture at all, it's going to be this terrible burden that's going to make my life miserable, and I really don't want it, so just keep it at a distance. Thank you very much. Hmm. They put little thought or attention towards it. This is where God, if we were talking about holiness, this is where God's supposed to get angry, right? It's where pastors and preachers are supposed to hammer on things, right? Well, I don't even see that. I see that God's wisdom and plan makes holiness a help to happiness, not a hurt. A help to happiness, not a hurt. And so it really is important that we really understand what it is rather than just what people say about it. So first of all, let's start with the reviews. What does our culture tend to think about holiness if they think about it at all? I've kind of come up with three. And then I'll ask you, because maybe you've got two or three more that you've heard of, but these are the kind of three that it boils down to me. Again, I don't think they hate it. I just think they think it's a burden. 
How many of you ever thought, heard people say something like, oh, those rules, goodness gracious, maybe they made sense back in the day, but we are so much smarter now. We've got science. It's just a new religion, and the guys wear white coats. Okay, it's just, just the way it works. So we've got science to answer all the questions. You don't need to worry about God and rules, and who cares what you do, you know? I mean, as long as you're not actively hurting people, just don't worry about it. Go live your life. There's only so much time. There's only so much fun that you can have. And why take a bunch of rules from a long time ago and stack them on your life? I mean, you've ever heard something like that, whether that's from an atheist or an agnostic or somebody. Yeah, it's just, you don't really need to chase that. It's a historical oddity that isn't really in play anymore. And how many of you realize that sometimes even in the church we say that? We just call it grace. I'll get there in a minute. I'm not anti-grace. I love grace. Paul talked a lot about grace. Do you know Paul also talks a lot about holiness? Yeah, we're going to get there in a minute. I mean, he does. Paul is great on grace. He dances all around the grace campfire and gets the choir singing. But he doesn't have any problem talking about holiness too. So obviously they can both exist at the same time. That matters. So that's kind of the first view. It doesn't matter. It's obsolete. Others in our culture see holiness or any try at it as an opportunity to be, er to be arrogant. Works something like this. Anybody here better at something than somebody else? Brian is much better mechanic than I am. I'm not mechanically disinclined, but if I hear a thump, he knows how to fix the thump. I just go, oh, it thumps. He's much better at it than I am. Pastor knows why my computer screen won't stop buffering. <laughs> okay, okay. That, that's so bad. How many of you are better at some things than other people? Okay. Have you ever bragged about that? Oh, I love it. I, I, I love, come on. How, how many of you have ever found a, re come on, you found a reason to trot out the fact that you are better at that game, that form, that project, that dish, whatever it is, than somebody else? You might not be unsufferable. I mean, you're not walking around with a sign saying, I are the greatest at. But, you know, come on. You kind of like being number one? Yeah. I've heard this whole holiness thing put something like this. If you can't outrun them, if you can't out-earn them, if you can't outwork them, then at least be a better person than them. You get something to brag about. Holiness is this idea that I'm nicer than you. I follow more rules than you. I must be a better person than you. So it's kind of an emotional leg up if you don't have a real one. Let me say that again. Not because I'm looking for an amen, but I want you to hear it. It's kind of an emotional leg up when you don't have a real one. As if you were really better than somebody else, you could run faster, earn more, be cuter, whatever. But since you can't pull that off, you just want to polish your halo a little bit and say, I are holy and you are a loser. So it's kind of a one-up arrogant move, a card you get to play that says, I'm still in the game because I got holiness points. And I think that sadly enough, sadly enough, Many people in the church over the last two millennia have given that cultural idea a whole lot of play. Let me give you one that's easy. It's easy to throw rocks at these people. Sorry. You know, we haven't heard from them in the last few years, the Westboro Baptist Church. We're holy, we're holy, we hate homosexuality. And they get out and they, you know, how many of you realize that God never said go and throw stones at somebody else's funeral to make a point about my holiness? That, that's not in the book. You're sinning to advertise holiness. Somehow I think there's a flaw there. Okay? Now, how many of you know that they're not the only people that have ever done things like that? So arrogance is not holiness. Arrogance is an improper attitude that violates holiness. But unfortunately, I think it's a common view that our world has about it. Third. Oh, wait a second. Hold on a second. I want to back this up, train it just a little bit. How many of you know that we didn't wait till today to deal with arrogance? You remember the story of the tax collector and the Pharisee praying in the temple? So all the way back then, they were still doing it, right? The tax collector comes in and says, oh, God, forgive me. I'm a terrible sinner. Loose Pastor Jeff paraphrase. And the Pharisee comes in and goes, oh, God, I'm glad I'm not as rotten as that terrible tax collector. Get my arrogant leg up. In the temple, what does Jesus say about that? 
Who goes home justified? The tax collector who knows he's broken, not the person who's arrogant and is advertising their holiness. Third, I think many people, even inside the churches in our world, see holiness as transactional. It's not something that makes me better than somebody else, but it makes me good enough to approach or please God. Holiness is the way to make God happy. Holiness is the way to make an angry God happy. How many of you have ever run around with those folks that believe in an angry God? I was ticked off all the time. In the Philippines, I actually went to the church of the angry God. That's what it was called. It's a Catholic church in the city of Vitorius. And it, it was fascinating. The back wall behind the altar is this 40-foot-long mural of the throne on top of a skull with crystal eyes. And Jesus, with a big glowing red heart, flaming eyes, sitting there blasting people around him. Welcome to church. <laughs> Sweet. You know, I mean, I, there may be cultural bits of this I don't understand. And, and okay, I, I, I don't want to be that insensitive. But it's actually a tourist site because I don't think you see that kind of thing most of the time. The angry God. Yeah, thankfully. The angry God, right? You know, we're, it's bad. It's upset. It's wrong. Let's go back to a book. I, I'm going to open to a book that I know you all do morning devotionals in every day. The book of Leviticus, yeah. Yeah, you knew where I was going, didn't you? The book of Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 2. Chapter 19, verse 2. Very Old Testament. Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, for I the Lord your God, am holy. You do it, because I do it. That's absolutely correct, by the way. I agree. Now, so many in this idea think that since God is holy, since he wants me to be holy, he commands it clearly right here, I had best get to obeying lots of rules. He came up with 613 of them in the Old Testament alone. I have trouble remaining, remembering 10. How many of you occasionally forget 10? Yeah. So now multiply that out to 613. What was God's point with creating 613 rules in the Old Testament law? You can't be as good as him. You can't do it. You're not going to do it. You're not, your will won't go there. Your strength won't go there. If you want to be like God on your own, getting there on your own requires perfection. Even if I could wipe out all sin from this point back, I still can't be good enough to keep all 613 rules going forward. Not possible. Very, very strong Old Testament concept. So I think what happens is, is in this idea that God wants holiness and holiness is rules, people think, well, not only should I follow God's rules, I should make up more of them. You ever met rule makers? Rabbis, rabbis are rule makers. How many, of you, how many of you were actually saved in the 1970s? How many of you don't remember the 1970s? You're way too young. <laughs> you, you escaped that. You know, that's good. I always said the 1970s were just, were just something to keep 69 and 80 from bumping into each other. But, but hey, we all lived there, right? <laughs> now, how many of you remember that Christian games back then, you weren't allowed to have dice? Because dice were gambling tools. You're going to hell if you roll a dice. That is a stupid rule that a human being created. Look in the Bible. It does not say, thou shalt not have dice. <laughs> it, it, okay, with cards, that was another one. You too. How many of you realize this is just going to blow somebody's mind? Not, not most of yours, but somebody's mind. How many of you know that the Urim and the Thummim, which were objects that were kept in the high priest's ephod, we're talking about one of the holiest pieces of gear that the, the, the chief servant of God in the Old Testament system they were randomizing objects. They would cast the Urim and the Thummim as a way to make a decision. Read dice. When, when there are 11 apostles trying to select the new 12th because one died, they drew lots, which is like dice. And yet in the 1970s, you got people saying you have to use spinners because spinners were holy. And dice were evil. 
Okay, this is the kind of stuff that the world looks at when we say the word holiness sometimes. Holiness is a waste of time, old bit of stuff that absolutely doesn't matter. Holiness is an arrogance. Oh, this I'm saying what the world thinks, not what we think. Holiness is a matter of pleasing a God who is a nitpicking rule crazy dude. Yeah. Absolutely they do. And which is part of the reason why you can't always trust the reviews. When our culture pushes holiness back as a stupid, troublesome hurt to your happiness, they don't understand what they're talking about. They've seen the wrong thing and misunderstood what God did. They've seen the wrong thing about themselves. How many of you know that most of the time in the world we think that our own ideas are good because they're our ideas? Anybody here ever had a stupid idea? Okay. Yeah, yeah, just ask your spouse. That, that, that's it. Yeah. If you're married, your spouse will be happy to point out two or three you've had yesterday. It, 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 it's, it's the way it works. Okay. I get that. Now, what does God say about holiness? We understand that, that you know, the world is confused, and we understand that we're no longer under a covenant of law. I get that. So what does God say about it? Have we dug in there lately? I started in Leviticus because Leviticus has a lot of rules. There are moral rules, right? Who you can sleep with and who you can't. That's a big section. How many of you know those rules about sewing and rules about mold in your house? and rules about eating, and rules about, you know, how you take care of farm animals, and rules, there's a lot of rules in there, okay? And we could look at those rules and go, oh my goodness, no wonder this was so burdensome. No wonder the, the world sees this. Have you ever noticed that if you have a radio show or an internet commentary, now Jeff, you see some of those, and you know, the people get online, and they're always pulling Old Testament rules out and blaming the church for them. Thank you! They, right? I mean, you, you can't have tattoos. Well, whether you like tattoos or not, how many of you know that that rule, we don't even know why that rule totally exists. Now, don't get mad at me. I'm not here to say go get them. I'm not here to say you're evil if you didn't get them. I'm saying we're not sure. It says do not mark your body or cut your body for the dead. Most scholars seem to think that that's a reference to a Canaanite religious ritual. We don't even know what it was anymore. Now, you want to get a tattoo, that's between you and your maker, and that's not the point I'm preaching about today. But I will say, there's a lot that gets misquoted, and it usually gets pulled out of the Old Testament. So what does God say? What does Jesus say? What does Paul say? You know, the other New Testament writers in the New Testament. Well, I'll give you one. Is holiness a subject? Yeah, look at 2 Corinthians 7.1. It's one of many. It was an easy one of many for me to pick. Simple passage. 2 Corinthians 7.1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Who is Paul talking to? Believers. He's not talking to evil unbelievers with a train load of problems. He's talking to believers in the church of Corinth. So look around. This passage is for you and you and you and you and me, right? Paul's not writing to bad folks. He's writing to self-identified believers in Jesus Christ. Now, he starts out with the idea of having these promises. What promises? If you go back in 2 Corinthians, you go back in 1 Corinthians, you find out that there's an awful lot of time Paul spends talking about behavior. Lawsuits, competition, sexual morality, you know, what you do with yourself over and over again. Lots of choices. Here's one. 1 Corinthians 6, 12, and 13. Sorry, 2 Corinthians 6, 12, and 13. All things are lawful for me. How many of us would just like to stop right there? Yes! All things are lawful for me. But Paul, doggone him, he keeps talking. But all things are not helpful. So I can do it. I might be able to do it and go to heaven someday. God's grace, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is big enough to handle that explosion of anger or to handle that bad choice. You know, okay, I get it. It's not a heaven game deal breaker, but it isn't helpful. 
And that gets me to where we're going to go in just a moment. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. And there's something to that, too. How many of you have ever been brought under the power of something? Let me give you an illustration. Can I? Maybe it's a little personal. My wife's at home right now. I'm so thankful for your prayers. Jim's at home right now. So thankful for your prayers. I mean, God has done some amazing things. Now, now you know, they split my wife. I, I, I tease him to say it's like a gutted calabash. You know what I mean? Yeah, she didn't like that phrase. But, but I mean, you know, it's whack, and it's a vertical slice right through all the muscle grips. Yeah, very painful stuff. And then they shove things over and ream it out and shove it over the other way. It's very physically bruising. Okay, so when they're done, they're like, okay, we want you to take all this Tylenol and all this Motrin and this rotating cycle, so you're on it all the time for a week, and then we're going to give you these oxycodone. And her eyes said, no, you're not. And they said, well, we're going to give you this first one when you're in the hospital. You're going to get this. You go, okay, I'll take this one, but I'm not taking any more. And we came home, and I'm like, okay, she's written a prescription for this. What do you want? Don't fill it. Now, my wife's never had an addictive personality, but we've had friends that have gone off on oxycodone and have lost their mind. And she said, I, 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 I don't want to do that. Now, am I telling you you're bad, she's good? No. Am I saying if you had to use it for pain, that that's, no. I'm just saying she realized this is something that I don't want to be under the power of. I've seen a friend who started as a believer, ended up as a mess because of the power of this drug. Don't want to go there. Willing to put up with rather exquisite pain rather than go there. Now, if you made other decisions in your time, fine. That, that's not even the question. She just said, for me, I don't want to go there. Can I promise you that a week from now she'll be saying that? Oh, no, but I think so. She's in the worst of it right now, and she's saying, I don't want it. How many times do we let things become the master of us? Now, it's easy to point at some things. Drug, sex, rock and roll. I'm kidding about the last one. But whatever. You know, right? You know, we, we kind of say, well, this is bad and that is bad and you can't do that. And, nah, you know, and we get all upset about it. How many of you know that all kinds of habits can be bad? All kinds of habits. Attitudes that we have about people. We just need to shut our mouth. Here's one. How many of you know that even if you don't say something bad about somebody to somebody else, but you say something bad about them in your own mind all the time, it's just as bad? Because you're damaging your relationships and your feelings towards that other person. You're running down and condemning them, even if you're doing it where nobody else can see. Okay. So this idea is, is, yeah, many things are lawful, they're forgivable, they may not be heaven deal breakers, but I don't want to come under the control or power of any of them. So believers have the promise, here's the promise that Paul is talking about, having these promises. What promises? The promise that Jesus died on the cross, his blood is applied to us, that our initial holiness is a gift. When God looks at us, he doesn't see our real record would be like the lions. If all of us suddenly assumed that they were Super Bowl capable. Right? I mean, it would take Jesus to accomplish that, I think. No. Right? How many of us are not necessarily Super Bowl spiritual contenders? We got baggage and trouble and issues, right? And Jesus died on the cross, and we can count on the fact that God the Father sees the love and the holiness of God the Son when he looks at me. That's good. That means we start in an amazing place. I think sometimes reading the reviews of the world about holiness, we might rewrite this verse. Be very careful, never rewrite verses. I, I'm, I'm joking. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us do what we want because God's got it. Is that what Paul said? Therefore, having these promises, because the past is secured by the love of Jesus Christ and salvation, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness. Cleanse ourselves. Not excuse ourselves. Not pretend that it's totally fine and God is utterly cool with every decision that I make. 
Cleanse ourselves of what? Not only the filthiness of the flesh, the stuff we actually do, but the filthiness of the spirit. Okay. Oh, boy. I'm going to get in trouble here. Oh, well. How many of us understand that having an affair is probably not a healthy thing? Not healthy for your marriage? Not healthy for your spiritual life? How many of you realize that that's actually forbidden? It's sinful. Uh oh. Okay. Wait, we lost. Can God that. forgive you? Yes. Can you go on to have a healed marriage? Yes. And, and am I trying to dance on your grave? No. But I'm saying, listen, that's, that's not a good thing. So, how many of you believe that keeping your sexual health in order is probably beneficial and leads towards God? God. Oh, they were too. Don't see any nose yet. Oh, okay. And yet, how many times have you ever been up late at night and the television has been up? Have you noticed that about 80% of what's on TV after a certain hour is pretty much just junk? Yes. <laughs> and, and how many times have you ever paused a little too long on the channel and then go, oh, I shouldn't be watching? Does that happen? It's pretty easy, isn't it? I mean, we don't set out to do it. The problem becomes, though, is that stuff does get planted in your mind. It's the filthiness of the spirit that ends up sometimes, if we're not <coughs> working out, into the filthiness of the flesh. Amen. So the media we take in, the people we hang around, have a way of growing like bad mold and coming out in places we don't expect. So here believers, secured by the love of Christ with their past forgiven, are told to cleanse yourself. Now how many of you, you don't have to cleanse yourself from what, in, what isn't there? Do you ever go just reorganize a perfectly clean closet? <laughs> Maybe if you're OCD. <laughs> How many of you have some perfectly organized drawers and closets and places and you, you can leave them there? All right. What do you cleanse again? What? Disorganization. Oh, okay. So how many of you today will have to cleanse dishes? Why? They're dirty. They're dirty. You use them. You mean your food doesn't levitate three inches above it? <laughs> no, that stuff gets on there. And, and you don't want to leave it because it turns into concrete. And that's not good. So you want to wash it. Your clothes, how many of you clean those? Why? Because they're dirty. Because you wear them and you have oil on your skin and blah, 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 blah. You clean what is dirty. So here in the passage, 2 Corinthians 7, 1, very New Testament, we're told that holiness... A cleansing of the filthiness of the flesh and spirit is important for believers in Jesus Christ. And then it goes on to this one more little phrase. Perfecting holiness. Oh, you didn't just do it a little bit. How many of you are occasional exercisers? <coughs> I'd be a real wife. <laughs> How many of you have ever taken a good fast walk and that is good enough for the month? You <laughs> yearn You took a good walk. You know what I mean? You picked up a box or two and carried it in from the garage. You're awesome. You're great. Okay. I, I think that's pretty easy to do. And I think that occasional holiness isn't all that threatening, is it? I could flip on the TV or not. Yeah, shut it off. I could do something on the internet that might not be perfect. Ah, I just shut that off. That's easy. Occasional holiness. But excising behaviors from my life, especially if it's a behavior that I kind of like, that's, that's tough, isn't it? It's tough. And yet we're told by Paul literally to do that, that we're supposed to, even as believers, take that up. We see another reference to this in 1 Peter 13 to 16. 1 Peter 1, sorry, what? First, First Peter 1, 13 to 16. It says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. That means work here first. I'm going to get a holiness starts here. Amen. Holiness doesn't start here. Holiness starts here. A decision. Be sober. 
That doesn't mean just don't get plastered. Be sober also means don't do things that make your judgment warped. Whatever that is. Relationships, activities, chemicals, whatever it takes to warp and influence your judgment, don't. And rest your hope, that hope that we have fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children. <coughs> How many of you have obedient children? Be careful, they might be sitting next to you. <laughs> so, kids are going, oh, oh, oh. Obedient children. Now, have you ever had a perfectly obedient child? <laughs> <laughs> New pastor Daniel. Yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Say that when my parents are here. Yeah, yeah. Let me express that. How many of you have ever been, as adults, perfectly obedient to your human parents? <laughs> uh, so we got some work to do. <laughs> obedient children. Now, I can guarantee you, in this life, let's face it, with holiness, in this life, you will not have a perfect record. You cannot have a perfect record. And you're not supposed to kick yourself for the rest of your life because you don't have a perfect record. You're supposed to trust in the promises of Jesus Christ to forgive those things that you cannot deal with. But you're supposed to work at this idea of holiness. Not conforming yourself to the former lusts. Lust isn't just about sex. It's about wanting anything you shouldn't have. I don't care what it is. As in your ignorance, Control yourself, learn, dig in, become wiser. Why? But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Amen. And then don't wrong at all if Jesus didn't up a notch. Remember those verses where it says it doesn't really matter if you kill somebody, but if you hate somebody, you say things about them? <coughs> that you're in the same boat? It's not just if you do something wrong with a woman, gentlemen, it's if you look lustfully at her. So God is not only looking at what you actually do, the tools that you pick up, the steps that you walk. He's looking at the thoughts that are part of your heart. Yeah. Yeah. They count. Yes. Now, finishing up this one. The reviewers got it wrong. If I just stopped there and I didn't say anything else, I think you would maybe say, well, okay, I understand it can't be an obsolete thing because in the New Testament to believers, Jesus is telling us, Paul is telling us, others are telling us, this is still really on the table. So it's not obsolete, so we've got to throw that one out. And there's nothing in the scripture that tells us that we're supposed to brag about our holiness. Not at all. And even Paul, who was very focused on holiness, said he was the chiefest and greatest of, greatest of sinners. So obviously there's no, there's no place to brag at others. Jesus chastised in the story of the, the tax collector and the Pharisee. The Pharisee for missing the point. But what about that third one? Is it back to just obey all the laws, obey all the laws, and please an angry, nitpicking God? I don't think so. Can I tell you what holiness is? I said it's a help to happiness, not a hurt. Holiness lets you drop the baggage rather than carry it. Amen. Holiness is a liberator. Amen. What do I mean? I don't want to see your hands. But I've heard some of our stories, and some of us lived wild and crazy youths once upon a time. <laughs> we did things that we don't necessarily want to unpack in <laughs> certain conversations. Certain. Can you live wild and crazy fast, and can God forgive you? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Can you mess up right now as a believer and go off on a wild, crazy tangent and find a place that God can still forgive you? Yes. 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 Yes, you can. But can I be honest with you? You carry all those memories in your noggin. All those memories. All those times when the chemical felt like the great escape. All the time that, that you, you're in your relationships with those other people that get played onto the screen of the relationship that you're in. All of the grief, all of the remorse, all of the problems. Maybe not 24-7. I'll catch you, Mike. 
But what happens is it just has a way of playing. It's not even God that throws that on the screen of your mind. It's the accuser of the brethren. Satan is really good at his job, and he remembers very well what you have done. Mm -hmm. And he will play that on you, and you have to carry it now. The self-destructive actions that have harmed your family, the things that you've chosen that have caused you to lose the opportunity that God meant as a blessing, all of those things you carry now. So holiness is not something you earn, it's something you get. You can't earn it. You can't earn it? And here's the neat thing about holiness. I think we get it wrong when we assume that any person in the world is going to be absolutely strict and straight and get everything right. You're not. I know God said, be holy as I am holy, but God knew that being as holy as God ain't possible in this life. But can I tell you what does do? Because it is a help, holiness is a help to happiness, you get to drop the weight. How many of you have ever had to go hiking and you're carrying gear you don't need? How many of you have ever gone to pack to move and realize you got stuff you need to get there? <laughs> <laughs> it gets old, doesn't it? And I know I've told the story a long time ago. When I did when I hiked Isle Royal, I started out with a pack that was about 50 pounds. Some of you go, ha! You could 50 pounds all day. Well, for this was in my two weeks of training, it was nightmarish. <laughs> and I remember looking at that load and saying, yeah, I got too much food here. I'm never going to eat Japanese food. There's no way. And it took half of the food that I had spent money and time and energy preparing, and I left it at, you know, in the van. No, oh, don't worry. I only ate half of what I still took. Oh, I had way too much food, right? Right? I just fed myself and like you know animals and not even animals. Yeah, I thought I needed it all. And, and the amazing thing is, when you're backpacking, you realize you have to carry everything with you. You carry your trash with you. You have to carry your waste with you. Should you be in one of those zones, you have to carry everything with you. You don't get to lose the load at all. And I can tell you the last mile of the trail on the last day, these knees were shot. They were utterly shot. And I am hanging onto my trail poles, like, you know, like they're crutches. And I'm just like, you know, it was awful. I can't tell you the last time I hurt that badly. It was awful. And I'm thinking, and I did this to myself. I carried all this to I had gear I didn't need. I had stuff I never unpacked. I could have got away with a 25 pound pack and I'd been happy. <laughs> Folks, we get into a situation where we jump out into our life and we say, I can handle it. I can do it. I can go there. All things are legal for me. All things are lawful. I can chase this relationship. I can chase this activity. I can chase this habit. I can have this attitude. It's great. And a few years in, our spiritual knees are killing us and our minds are hurting and we've got remorse and garbage that we've been carrying for far too long. And God says, "If will you drop it now? You can't go back to when you were 16 and start over. You can't, risk, you can't erase the reality recorder. You did what you did, but I've already forgiven it. Can you drop it now? Can you begin? How many of you realize if you start anywhere with holiness, anywhere, starting your attitude, starting your television watching, start wherever the Holy Spirit taps your soul. You don't have to take my rules, but I'm not going to hand out the rules of Chairman Jeff. I'm not going to do that. But if you can go ahead and say, the Lord is tapping me, telling me this is probably something to drop, Amen. drop it, and you don't have to carry it anymore. Amen. You. And eventually you get to the place where your happiness isn't compromised by the garbage that you've been carrying on your back to. Amen. Amen. Anybody have been this morning? I don't know what that means for you. I don't have a list of Christian sins in my mind that to, I don't. I didn't have any group of people in my head saying, man, I hope I think this. <laughs> no. I have a lot of my own foolish memories and the own stupid things I carried parts along. All 
all I want you to do is see that the reviewers were all wrong and our culture has got their minds totally screwed up about what holiness is. It isn't obsolete and it isn't about bragging rights and it doesn't give you a free pass to a backstage tour with God. Holiness is freedom. Holiness is an accessory to happiness. Holiness is dropping away he never intended you to care. And if you'll let him tap your heart today and say, start here, that's the place you have to start. Don't worry about trying to pray that you get it all in one fell swoop. You won't. I won't. Not possible. We can start somewhere. Lord Jesus, here we are. I know that because of your death on the cross, the Father looks at my life and the Father looks at all of our lives and he says, you're, you're, you're clean. You're cool. And I am so deeply thankful for that. Lord Jesus, this life is not yet over. And the enemy loves to remind each one of us of our failures and our flaws. So Holy Spirit, I ask you that you begin to speak to me and to each one here this morning and begin to show us where you would have us begin to walk this road of holiness. What does that mean? What relationship do we back away from? What habit do we begin to stop? What attitude needs to change? God, I ask you to help us on that battlefield to drop the weight, not carry it anymore. I thank you for the freedom that you can give each and every one of these people, the goodness that can come out of it. I'm going to be here this morning without identifying anything to me other than this. I'm going to you say, you know, there are some things I think I need to drop. There are some things I think I need to drop. There are hands here of believers, I've been believers for 50, 60 years. There's hands of people that I don't know when they were saved. Young and old, male and female. Lord well, Jesus, we're just going to take a few minutes around this altar before we break and then eventually go into our business meeting. We're going to ask you, you would touch us at this point and we've identified. And you'd help us to have a plan to stop here. Your precious name. Amen. As the worship team comes to play, just take a moment, whether it's at your seats or up here, just dedicate that bit to God. Okay? That issue. God, help me do with this. The very fact that we're alive, the very fact that we're saved, are because of your grace, your kindness, your love. Thank you for the promises that you've given us. Lord Jesus, I don't believe that you would have ever talked about holiness, or you would have ever had the other anointed writers of Scripture talk about holiness, if holiness was not meant to be part of the life that we live. So God, I ask you to help us moving forward, to focus on those things your Holy Spirit is telling us, to take them seriously to work, Lord Jesus, to not earn your favor. You've already given us that in Christ. Not brag about somebody, uh, right over somebody else. Lord Jesus, to live a life free of trouble that we don't need. God, I thank you for freeing us. In your precious name.